But now let's go to another piece of this. One of the things that people will always recognize as being unique to IBM I is this thing that we call single level storage, right? It came from Dr. Frank Soltz's uh, PhD paper. That's one of the reasons he was hired into IBM was to help uh, implement this thing. And the whole idea was at the time and still today, outside of storage area networks. People who have systems have to manage where that data gets stored so that the system can access it. And the, the uniqueness, the value, the genius behind single level store was and is, if you could, as an operating system, manage all of your storage as if it's one piece of memory, then you, the operating system, could decide when should things actually be stored on disk and where should it be stored, okay? All while having your programs that are written on top of you just treat everything that's in storage, not as a thing that's on a particular volume and a particular track on a particular disk, but as just one thing that has its own unique address. You could deal with that and that would be great, okay? So that actually was created as part of System 38. It allowed System 38 to spread the data under whatever storage was attached to System 38 so that the system could optimize its use. It also integrated nicely with the database that was part of System 38 so that then the database and storage management could work together so that it could balance things correctly. So that's, of course, what we had. It was very, uh, I've just showed you a picture here to show you kind of what, what an address looked like and what it meant back then. Um, this is this was available in the initial specs of the AS400. So there's nothing being confidential here. And, and by the way, it's not this way anymore. But one key piece of this was that every address that we had was not just a set of bytes. By the way, it was a set of bytes. It was four words put together. That's what the address was, four words put together. But it was also an indicator for each of those words in storage that it was part of one of these single level store addresses. So there was a thing we call a tag added to each one of the pieces of the address so that the operating system and the hardware knew this should be treated differently from just a normal string of bits, okay? That single level store using tag bits often got people to say this was the 65th bit. It essentially was actually 65, six, seven, and eight. Um, bits that indicated that these parts of storage were um, unique. They should be treated uniquely. So System 38 had this thing and it was single level store and it's part of this platform today. But, but <laughs> is single level store the same on AS400 as it was on System 38? It is not, was not. People, again, think of this stuff as being immutable. It came into existence from the mind of the great creators of the platform and never changed again. It actually changed in AS400 from System 38. You see, people who were designing the AS400 said, single level store is great, but you know, we ourselves in the operating system and customers might want to have a good business reason to group some of the storage and then have single level store, yes, manage things, but manage things across groups of storage. And so they wanted to have these groups and so those became what are known as auxiliary storage pools. So from the very beginning of, of AS400, it changed what System 38 single level store was to be multiple parts of a single level store stored according to these auxiliary storage pools. Okay? So that was key. It's important for you to understand that even when you think back on AS400 having that initial perfect architecture and coming from the System 38, it actually had to modify for good technical business reasons from the beginning. Now I'm going to fast forward you a bit. <clears throat> Those of you who've been with the platform in the 30 year range, you'll remember this. But when we initially created this platform, when we created it with what the computer industry called a complex instruction set. So we were at a complex instruction set computer. We had a processor that had far more instructions, well, considerably more instructions than a reduced instructions that computer had. And that, that complex instruction set computer was the hardware that was at the bottom of this thing. Well, we knew that there were advantages to having a reduced instruction set computer. We also knew that the whole industry, and in particular, all of IBM system hardware was going to a risk-based set of processors. 
So we were going to have to deal with a new hardware, a new processor that was going to be risk. In order to do that, we had to be able to implement a new layer of the operating system below the machine interface that was going to adopt this 64-bit risk processor. In order to do that, well, we had the architecture in place with the technology independent machine interface that would protect all of you, all of your compiled code that was compiled to the machine interface. We could protect that as long as we could implement all of the stuff that was in the virtual machine code and the horizontal machine code on top of this new 64-bit risk processor. As we looked at that um, internally, trying to figure out how to do it, what we ultimately had to do was write an entirely new set of the operating system. Everything had to change, okay? There is not a single piece of that stuff below the MI that still exists from the days of the AS400 in our below the MI stuff. It had to be entirely rewritten. So when we went from sys to risk, we also had to change how the addresses were done. Okay, so the single level store got affected by this change in how we did our technology independent machine interface implementation because the processor underneath the covers had to change. And so there was a retranslation required so that all of those addresses that were in your software, your software is dealing with addresses, all those addresses could now be addresses that were going to be implemented on top of the 64-bit processor. And so, again, the addresses look different. And again, I'm not telling you anything that's super secret here. And in fact, things have changed slightly since then. But the point is, we had to re-implement all of that. So the single-level store that existed in release 1 of AS400 is not the single-level store, at least at the implementation layer, that existed from V3R6 on. Okay, So there was a change in how all that happened. And then, then, after that happened, a couple of days, decades later, we decided that those auxiliary storage pools, we should make them independent of the machine. We should be able to create an independent auxiliary storage pool that, yes, while it was attached to a particular I-series, while it was attached to a particular I-series, it could function within that I-series, but it could also be detached from that I-series, AS400, but mostly I-series, okay, and attached to another one and be inserted into the single level store of that other system. That independent auxiliary storage pool required us to make yet another major change to the architecture of single level store to allow that stuff to happen, okay? So that was another key change to the architecture. So while, of course, we still have single level store, it can now do more than it ever did. And we had to change all that stuff again without affecting what you folks did. Now, one thing about single level store is that every time you use it, the stuff that you use, uh, the stuff that you put in that storage thing is assumed to be backed by physical storage. Okay, so if you are manipulating a piece of data on IBM I and it's and it is a single level store address, it is going to be assumed that it's going to be put on disk. That is a valid assumption for the key critical business data that associate with transactions or user authentication, all that stuff that makes perfect sense. But in today's modern programming environment, there are things that don't ever need to get stored on disk. Temporary storage is used over and over and over again. And we'll talk about that when we talk about program models over and over and over again, okay? But the temporary storage that was served up by single level storage is still backed by storage. So when you created temporary storage for the software that's running on IBM's single level store architecture, we had to reserve space on the storage, even if it was never going to be used. And sometimes that temporary storage, because of the <clears throat> mechanisms we have for doing paging and so on, would get pushed out to storage, causing a delay. Why should it ever have to happen? And so we had to do something new and different. And we created this thing called TerraSpace. Okay. TerraSpace was conceived of as an address space that could sit alongside single level store, but it would never ever have actual physical storage associated with it and would never be pushed to any sort of 
storage device. So if you're running an application today and you have a, a, a temporary storage space stored in, in TerraSpace, you're manipulating things. And when you want to do something, you can do something that will get into single level storage. You can create a, an insert, update, whatever to your database, and that will cross over into single level store and be stored on storage. But all the stuff that you're doing in TerraSpace will not. Okay. And that is critical. It was absolutely necessary because every paste based application, which means every open source application and any ILE application that specifically asks to use TerraSpace for its temporary storage can now gain the benefit of super fast compared to single level store, super fast temporary storage. So the architecture again about how we do storage management had to evolve over time. Now you'll recognize, and I'll come back to this idea of TerraSpace in particular and some of the in, uh, independent ASP stuff as I go through this, 